of the things we fashion for them that they might be comforted. Dawn is the one that works. When darkness sifts from the air like fine soft soot and light spreads slowly out of the east, then all but the most wretched of humankind rally. It is a spectacle we immortals enjoy, this minor daily resurrection. Often we will gather at the ramparts of the clouds and gaze down upon them, our little ones, as they bestir themselves to welcome the new day. What a silence falls upon us then, the sad silence of our envy. Many of them sleep on, of course, careless of our cousin Aurora's charming machitinal trick. But there are always the insomniacs, the restless ill, the lovelorn tossing on their solitary beds, or just the early risers, the busy ones, with their knee bends and their cold showers and their fussy little cups of black ambrosia. Yes, all who witness it greet the dawn with joy, more or less, except, of course, the condemned man, for whom first light would be the last on earth. Here is one standing at a window in his father's house, watching the day's early glow suffuse the sky above the mast trees beyond the railway line. He is condemned not to death, not yet, but to a life into which he feels he does not properly fit. He is barefoot and wearing pyjamas that his mother on his arrival last night found from somewhere in the house, threadbare cotton, pale blue with a bluer stripe. Whose are they? Whose were they? Could they be his from long ago? If so, it is from very long ago, for he is big now and they are far too small, and pinch him at the armpit on the fork. But that is the way with everything in this house. Everything pinches and chafes and makes him feel, feel as if he were a child again. He is reminded of how, when he was a little boy here, his grandmother would dress him up for Christmas or his birthday or some other festival, tugging him this way and that and spitting on a finger to plaster down a stubborn curl, and how he would feel exposed, worse than naked, in those already outmoded, scratchy, short-trousered tweed suits, the colour of porridge that the old woman made him wear and the white shirts with starched collars and, worst of all, the tartan dicky bows that had afforded him a one vindictive pleasure to pull out to the limit of their elastic and let snap back with a pleasingly loud smack when someone was making a speech or singing a song or the priest was holding up the communion wafer. Like, he always thought, the nurse on the hospital sweepstakes tickets, brandishing aloft the winning number. And that is how it is. Life, tight-buttoned life, fits him ill, making him too much aware of himself and what he glumly takes to be his unalterable littleness of spirit. I write to the cadence and the rhythm of what we call Hiberno English, which is very different to English English. Uh, it's a, almost a patois. Uh, it's a very fluid and supple and rich literary tool. Uh, as I say, it's very different to English English. So that's the rhythm that I write to, and I hear that in my head. We lost the Irish language in the middle of the 19th century, but its influence is still there. My aim is to make my prose as dense and as, I suppose, as demanding as poetry. Uh, W.H. Auden said that the poem is the only work of art that you either take or leave. You have to read it or not read it. You know, you can look at a picture and think of something else, you can listen to a piece of music and your mind can wander. But that's not the case of the poem. And I try to make my prose uh, to be as demanding as that. Every novelist imagines that he's a god, or at least a, a demigod. Uh, there we are, controlling this little world that we invented and moving these little characters about. And then the voice of Hermes is funny and irreverent and sometimes silly and sometimes uh, sad because, of course, the immortals envy us our capacity to die and our capacity to love. Well, Banville and Black write completely differently. Uh, Banville would be lucky if he can scratch out a couple of hundred words a day. Uh, old Black can knock off, you know, maybe 2,000 in a day. It's an entirely different way of, of, of writing, and the way I think of it is that what you get with Banville is the result of deep concentration. What you get with Black is the result of spontaneity. Well, it would be hideous to name names. Uh, Timothy Finlay, I thought, was a wonderful writer, much underrated, certainly underrated in Europe. Uh, we barely heard of him there. And of course, Alice Munro is still, still a wonderful, one of the greatest short story writers. So there, I've been invidious and named two names. Well, it's very nice to win something like the Man Booker Prize. Uh, one's bank manager stops waking up screaming in the night at the thought of one's overdraft. Mm -hmm.